Okay, I'm going to let everybody in. Okay. Well, we still have some stragglers getting in. I'll give it like 30 more seconds here. Okay. All right, I wanna, uh, good evening. Everybody, thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Natalie Luna Rose. I'm the Outreach and Communications Manager for the Arizona Center for Disabilities Law. Uh, and tonight's session is Disability Discrimination in School Extracurricular Activities, Complaint Options and Strategies for Getting Your School to Stop It, Prevent It, and Address the Impact. Oh, I'm sorry, that's tomorrow's, and I'm reading the wrong one. So I'm wondering if there Sorry about that, Amanda. So tonight's discussion is what is it, what are your rights, and what do you need to know as a, a student or parent? So our presenters tonight are Francine Skolnick. She's a former high school student athlete. And Rose Daly Rooney, our legal director here at the Arizona Center for Disability Law. And Rose, I am going to pass it on to you. Um, but actually, before I do that, if you have any questions, please use the chat um, button at the bottom of your bar. If you do have a question, you're what you um, can answer, uh, you can ask it during the session, either by the chat or you can raise use the raise hand function. If you um, are in need of Spanish, we do have a Spanish uh, interpretation in the Spanish room. On the same bar to the right of the chat button will be a little world button that says interpretation. You can click that, and a box will come up, and you can click which room you're uh, comfortable in and listening to the session in. It's either English or Spanish. So now, without further ado, I will pass it off to our legal director, Rose Daly. And will you uh, put the um, PowerPoint up? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. And we don't have to wait for that to come up to uh, start, but one is, um, if you'll go to the next slide, please, Natalie. Uh, as Natalie said, there's two parts to this series, and uh, we have more people signed up tonight than we do tomorrow, and both sessions are really important. So what, today we're going to talk about the laws that protect people, uh, protect students. Um, we're going to talk about what is the scope of non-academic and extracurricular activities, uh, what and then we're going to have, hear about a personal experience from our, our other um, presenter, Francine, and she's gonna talk a little bit about her experience addressing um, concerns regarding um, harassment during her high school um, years. We're also gonna talk about who's covered by these laws, um, who's protected by these laws, and then types and examples of discrimination. Now, one of the things that we're, uh, for tomorrow night, why it's so important to come tomorrow night is we tell you what what discrimination looks like, what's you know what violates the law tonight. But tomorrow night we tell you about how to report discrimination and harassment, to make sure that you have set the stage to address it, uh, to get the school to address it. Um, if the school doesn't uh, address it when you report it, we're going to talk about internal grievance procedures. We're going to talk about if that doesn't work, you can file complaints with outside agencies. And we're going to give you tips for filing good complaints um, and types of relief you can ask that outside agency to um, seek and what to expect if you do file a complaint. So we hope that anybody who's joining us today will be sure to join us tomorrow too. Um, now you're seeing that there is a two sides to these slides and uh, there's a Spanish a version. Our translation wasn't completed yet, and so we are going to post this uh, PowerPoint presentation um, with Spanish, um, and you can get it from contacting Natalie Luna Rose. We will make that available. So if you're in the Spanish room, you're getting your translation, but you can also um, get a copy of this just as anyone who wants a copy can. Uh, so uh, next slide is uh, really about the discrimination laws. And 
we're focusing on disability discrimination tonight. Uh, and that's because we're the Arizona Center for Disability Law. That's what our uh, that's what our mission is, is to address those kinds of issues. But we want you to know about the other laws because discrimination doesn't always uh, just pick one protected group. Sometimes people are discriminated against because of their disability and their race. Uh, it might be a two things going on or because they're a female athlete with a disability. So. We wanted you to know that there are laws that protect people, not just people with disabilities, but Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act uh, of, and Title II of the ADA are two federal laws that protect people with disabilities. Um, and they prohibit discrimination based on disability. And that is, uh, and we will see later on in the presentation, that means schools too. Um, we're gonna talk about which schools. Um, so. Also, though, in addition to that, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of uh, 1964 prohibits, I'm sorry, I meant to say Title VI. Title VI prohibits discrimination based on race, color, and national origin. And also, Title IX of the Education Amendments Act prohibits discrimination based on sex. And sex can mean, uh, based on sex can also include uh, people based on LGBT status. Um, so that's, uh, those are the laws and the agencies that we'll talk about tomorrow can investigate complaints on any of those uh, bases. So, you know, uh, what are um, A to Z? Um, yes, next slide. You anticipated correctly, Natalie. <laughs> next slide is that we're going to talk about non-academic and extracurricular activities is one little regulation in the Rehabilitation Act. And, and um, so, but it, it encompasses a lot of things. Um, so people should be free from discrimination in all non-academic and extracurricular activities. So we kind of did a, what's the, on the school base, on the school theme, A to Z, A to Z um, types of activities. So next slide, we've just identified numerous uh, types of activities that fall into an extracurricular uh, the meaning of extracurricular. So athletics and intramural sports, um, band, choral, orchestra, any kind of music groups uh, that are done, uh, community service groups. Some schools set up community service projects or have key clubs or other things where people uh, perform community service as part of a school related project. Counseling services, sometimes that's offered to all students and um, drama, speech, and debate. And that's just in few clubs. There's many, many clubs that a school may have. Sometimes schools offer employment. Uh, so they might have uh, jobs students can do to earn money or get job experience. Um, and they may be on campus or off campus. Any of those could be covered. Next slide. Um, Another big thing in which you see a lot of complaints about are field trips, kids with disabilities being excluded from field trips or uh, protections not being made for field trips. Other complaints we see are graduation, graduation ceremonies in particular, for example, uh, being able to participate in the ceremony and, all, and the activities surrounding graduation. Um, sometimes there are not just sports competitions, but there's academic competitions like math leagues and other academic athons or both. Those are ones that are also covered. Another big part of high school life um, and some middle school can be uh, dances, pep rallies, uh, proms. Uh, and so those are considered extracurricular activities. Uh, we already said service clubs, next uh, slide. And then a lot of schools do activities to promote science, technology, engineering, and math, and to get people to participate and students to participate in that for possible careers later in life. Activities related to that are extra, can be extracurricular activities if they're outside of regular classroom. Tutoring when offered to all students. Um, work and career skills and development skills. And yearbook club, that can be another big part of a big part of school for students. So those are some examples. Your school may have more activities than just those. Uh, they may not have all of those, but these are the types of things that were intended to be 
um, protected uh, and be free of discrimination. So now we have, uh, next slide, uh, we're going to talk about, we're gonna um, talk to Francine, um, Fran, uh, who, who want, we wanted to have someone who could talk about their experience at high school and how they dealt with it. And uh, we really appreciate that Francine is willing to share her story and hope that it um, helps other people. So, um, so tell, us your, uh, tell us your name. My name is Francine Skolnick. And uh, Francine, uh, are you, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. I am a former high school graduate. I currently enroll in Fremont Community College. I'm pursuing a basic business certificate. My plan after finishing college is to open up my little business, um, run my own coffee and food for shop. I am a person with Down syndrome, but I don't know if that stopped me from fulfilling my dream. Um, that's really um, well. That's really interesting, and in that uh, and you have you already have a a career goal in mind. A lot of people don't have a career goal this early in life. Um, so you're starting college and with a uh, intent to get your business and open a pastry shop. That sounds good. Um, you can't, everybody loves pastries, right? <laughs> so what extracurricular activities did you participate in during high school? I participated um, in reading and track and field, doing government uh, at the LA Major Business Students of America. So you had some activities that were kind of the uh, non-sports like uh, student government and business leaders uh, leadership. And then you also had um, some things with related to sports, um, cheer and, um, and track and field. So what did, when did you start, uh, when did you start uh, your doing cheerleading? I started cheerleading and doubling and been solid since fifth grade. And uh, what about uh, track and field? When did you start that? I started track and field on my senior year. Now, uh, what did you like? Of, what did you like about being in um, cheer, uh, cheer on the cheer squad? I like the physical activity. I like the movement and. Uh, I mean, music and movement. I like to source a part of cheerleading. Yeah, and uh, that's uh, all those are like, I think reasons why people do pick things sometimes to stay fit during high school or meet people, things like that. Did you, um, uh, were you good at cheerleading? Was that a, something you were good at? I was very good at it. Um, I went to three state competitions and I won second place in my middle school team. So you won some competitions. Yeah, that does sound like you were very good at it. Um, what, um, what did you have, uh, did you face any problems um, like, did you feel like you faced any discrimination in student government? No, I did really well. So that went well. What about the business, uh, lead, business? I, and I got that one a little bit wrong, but the future business of America, what, is that something that, uh, did you have any trouble in that area facing any discrimination? No, uh, I did really well on that one too. And, but you, uh, what, you did face some problems in uh, cheer, is that right? Yes. So, uh, what um, what did uh, who do you believe discriminated against you? My high school cheer coach, my cheer team, the athletic director, the principal. And 
And uh, what, what happened that made you feel like you were being uh, discriminated against? My high school teachers did not allow me to participate in cheer and then with activities. My cheer team hid from me. They ignored me. They were laughing at me. They wouldn't talk to me. Um, that must have been that must have been really hard, especially when it was something you really liked to do and didn't get the offer. You know, had trouble being able to do that. Um, how did that um, How did that make you feel? It made me feel really bad. It made me feel excluded. It made me feel behind. It made me feel um, not contemplating in my school and made me feel confused and I felt alone. Um, what did you what did you do about it? About the treatment you received? I never stopped going to cheer practice. Even when my coach excluded me, I was there. Um, I told my parents. Um, we wrote many letters to the school, but the school didn't do anything about it until my senior year. And uh, did you, um, did, so I think that's pretty amazing, you know, that in the face of that, you didn't give up and you just kept going. Um, even when you felt like you, you didn't feel welcome, you felt excluded. Um, did anything get better? You said you wrote a lot, you, you told your parents, your parents wrote some letters. Did anything get better over the course of your high school? Yes, it did get better. They hired a new field coach, a new cheerleading team. I was fully um, participated in cheer practices and many events. And I was included in photos. I got a uniform just like the other cheerleader. Well, that's great. You accomplished a lot then. Um... What, what advice do you have for student athletes or other students uh, who face discrimination or harassment at school? Don't give up. Don't keep it inside because it hurts. And always talk to your parents. Talk to other coaches. Uh, talk to the principal. Write a letter to the school. Advocate. Um, well, that's um, you. Um, that's good advice. And when um, when you um, if you tune in tomorrow uh, to the Morris thing, we will give you some more tips for following Francine's great advice. And um, Francine, we really appreciate you sharing this. It's not easy, and uh, we really um, I think that it helped it helped us illustrate this instead of just a lawyer sitting, standing up here talking. Um, it's really important to hear what happens to um, students and, and your personal experience. And we really appreciate that. Um, we're gonna, we'll, we'll then tell people a little bit about like, if what's, you know, who, what are the covered schools? So the next slide, covered schools, and we can just go to the next slide. Um, will include public school districts, uh, preschool, elementary, secondary. Uh, it includes charter schools. Um, it includes uh, colleges too. So, I mean, we're focusing on elementary, middle school, secondary uh, for this 
presentation, but these rules and the things that we're talking about and the complaint options tomorrow night, those all apply to uh, colleges too. Um, just like Francine's now no longer a high school student, she's a college student and um, she's got a good start there, but they, these, uh, these laws follow her, follow her from high school to college. Um, and any school that receives federal financial assistance all, um, and except for private religious, uh, some private religious uh, schools. And if people have questions about which ones fit into that category, they can always contact um, a CDO or a lawyer to get another lawyer to get more um, information. And also governing uh, athletic associations. There's athletic associations that uh, are, affect schools and they can also come into play. For example, there was a news article in the last couple of years about a student with um, albinism that had uh, affected blindness albinism. They still could see and they just needed a, um, a shade advisor. And one of the high school, uh, one of the college athletic associations wasn't going to allow a shaded, um, a shade advisor on the football helmet and had to make an exception um, as a reasonable accommodation. So it can also go beyond schools. Next slide. Okay, who is protected? And, uh, and our next slide will tell us some of the people that are protected. And obviously students, students like Francine are protected by these laws and other students, as well as parents with disabilities. So, um, and in extracurricular activities, parents oftentimes like to go and see their um, son or daughter in uh, the activities at the school and they need to be uh, not subject to discrimination and be allowed to participate. Also school visitors, um, school visitors uh, who are there on a purpose, they um, also have a um, right to be free from discrimination. For example, if a visitor comes to the school and has a service animal, they shouldn't be subjected to discrimination. So uh, also, what does disability mean? It's a very, very broad term. Um, and so, but if your son or daughter, if your student is um, eligible for an IEP, they're, gonna, they're going to fit that broad definition. If they, um, but it's also for people, not just people who are on an IEP. It could include people, um, with other kinds of disabilities uh, uh, who might uh, not fit for, not need special education, but they have a disability. It's basically a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. And so that includes a wide range um, of people. Next slide. Uh, so what are, what are we looking at? Like um, Francine's story tells us about what happened to her, which, um, that tells us about one type of discrimination, but there are other types too. So if we go to the next slide, we're gonna talk about the various, way, various types of discrimination. So excluding or limiting students with disabilities from participation in extracurricular activities because of disability. That's something that, um, or offering an unequal opportunity or providing a segregated program. For example, um, it was, you know, Francine's concern that she wasn't able to go to all the practices, wasn't able to participate in all of the cheers with the other um, cheerleaders that didn't get to do all the performances. That would be a way of providing, you know, excluding from full participation. Um, next slide. And in addition to the ones we just talked about, which is really like the last ones I talked about are like, don't treat people with disabilities differently than other people less favorably. Um, and that's kind of what those uh, were. But there's other times that, uh, there's other types of discrimination where we need to level the playing field and give to give a person with a disability an equal opportunity. And that um, includes uh, deny some of the things that you need to, that a school may need to do to level the playing field is um, provide reasonable modifications. So denying reasonable modifications to rules and policies, that could be a form of discrimination. For example, most schools have a no animal policy, no pets on the print, but you have to make an exception when it's a service animal. Same story with a young football player. 
um, who needed advisor because of the nature of his visual impairment. That uh, was a reasonable modification to a rule. Using non-essential requirements to exclude students with disabilities. So schools are allowed to have some essential uh, rules and requirements, but those, but there are some that are just not essential. They're not necessary um, in order to uh, do it. For example, maybe a school signs up all the students up for SATs uh, to take the SAT or the ACT, and they uh, they do that, but they don't do it for kids on IEPs. Well, that is not an essential. Not being on IEP is not an essential. Um, I just used two double, I just used two negatives, sorry. Let me do that again. <laughs> um, being, um, not requiring any kind of special education, students in special education are entitled to take the SAT and the ACT. And so not providing that uh, registration wouldn't be uh, appropriate. Another thing that schools need to do to level the playing field is to uh, provide auxiliary aids and services. We have an example here where we have ASL interpreters translating. So if a school is putting out a program um, and they're providing, let's say they're providing harassment training to students to know what does it look like and what they need to do um, if they see harassment or they experience harassment and they have deaf students in the audience and they fail to provide an interpreter. That's denying an important auxiliary aid and service. Um, but there are many, uh, you know, there's people who are hard of hearing might need CART services um, and people might need other types of uh, services. Uh, people who are uh, visually impaired might need uh, the materials in an extracurricular activity to be in large print. For example, a program from a drama thing, might, they might need to have some uh, large print copies. So, um, and failing to remove architectural barriers. Um, architectural barriers uh, are certainly ways in which there are obstacles, um, not just attitudinal obstacles, but they are real obstacles to people being able to participate. So, um, is the graduation platform where people walk across, does it have a ramp so that students with disabilities um, can, in wheelchairs, can participate? Going to our next slide, um, this focuses on the type of uh, discrimination that Francine talked about uh, in how she felt discriminated against during her high school um, years until, her, uh, until she was able to get the matter resolved. And that's harassing students with disabilities or failing to take action to stop and prevent harassment that the school knew or reasonably should have known about. So uh, you can have different types of harassment. You can have a, a teacher, a coach, uh, a, uh, a club sponsor, you know, a faculty sponsor uh, doing this, the harassment, um, or you can have a, another student doing it, or you could even have a third party. Um, for example, um, let's say there's a track and field meet and there's judges, and those judges uh, say something derogatory to a person with a disability. Um, that could, you know, make real, belittle them every time there's a competition. That's uh, also unlawful harassment. Uh, so even if it wasn't someone by the school. But that's why tomorrow night's program is important uh, because it tells you how in those kind of cases we have to make sure the school knows about it because if they don't know about it, they can't do anything about it. So um, next slide. So um, what is harassment? Um, and uh, one is it's, it can be verbal acts. It can be uh, name calling, graphic and written statements. Um, it can be physical acts. Uh, that is not listed on, yes, it is. Conduct that may be physically threatening, harmful, or humiliating. It can also include, um, uh, also it can include things that are on um, using social media. Um, so that could that could be a form of harassment too, um, belittling someone or taking uh, making derogatory comments about them, about their protected status because of their disability, et cetera, or um, on social media outlets that our students are using um, against another student. Again, these are things that a school may not know about unless it's reported. 
so um, when we're responding to uh, when schools, what are schools actually supposed to do? Um, and when uh, responding to harassment, a school must uh, take immediate and appropriate action to investigate and otherwise determine what occurred. And the investigation that they undertake is going to depend upon a number of things, like what's the um, how widespread is it? Is it just one person who are being complained about, or are you complaining about an entire team uh, engaging in it? Um, if is it uh, is it a is it a teacher or is it a group of coaches, all like a coach and an assistant coach? Who is involved in it? Um, that's going to ma matter how what the investigation needs to look like, um, and how often, how long has it been going on? Um, and where, what are the people that, um, you know, are there witnesses? How many witnesses are there? Those kinds of things. Uh, if, um, so anyway, and sometimes, uh, sometimes it's a matter of, um, it might be things that are, uh, for example, graffiti. Um, so looking into who did the graffiti, um, is it, uh, where is it, is it all over the school? Is it in one place? So it takes, it looks at what, is going on, uh, what are the allegations, and then the investigation is going to have to be um, big enough or small enough to take care of that, uh, look into that issue. Um, and as we said, the other four other things that will affect that could be um, the age of the student or students, um, the uh, size of the school, the size of the administrative structure, and other factors. Um, but in any case, a, an investigation should be prompt. So if someone reports um, harassment, it shouldn't be investigated two months later, it should be investigated soon, within days to start that investigation. Um, it should be thorough um, and it should be impartial. Next slide. Um, if there is, um, and this is what, if the um, investigation reveals discriminatory harassment did occur, um, then schools have another obligation, and that's to take uh, prompt and effective steps that um, that will uh, hope to eliminate the that that are calculated to eliminate the harassment um, and the and its effects and prevent it from recurring. So we should break that down a little bit. And one is we want to stop the harassment and re, you know, return to a safe and where people feel safe and they don't feel subjected to this kind of um, this kind of harassment or discrimination. But then you also want to um, deal with the effects of it because it's already happened. And if it's been going on for a while, it's going to have it's going to have an impact. Um, for example, Francine told us how, you know, how it made her feel um, and that she had a lot of emotions about how, how she felt about what was going on. So that's something that has to be taken care of too, is deal with, um, does, does a student need to be, does a student need to receive some counseling? Do the people who observed it, um, do they need to have some counseling bystanders? Um, you know, people who saw it didn't know what to do. Were they impacted by it? Um, and then also for the person engaging in it. We're, schools are supposed to be learning environments, and there's still opportunities for students to who engage in this kind of conduct to learn, uh, to learn from it, um, and to change. I mean, hopefully, we want to see that people can be can change. So um, when when sometimes. Uh, when you have someone who's been um, the target of harassment, then you have to, and they and they've reported it, and you found that that it's true. A school's found that it's true, or is con or wants to take protective steps during the investigation. Um, it may have to accuse the, the people who have been the people who have been accused of doing it may have to be uh, separated from the person that's been targeted for that. And so we look at ways looking at that might be a type of relief training. Uh, and I'm sure that if you uh, had a problem with your school um, with harassment and you told them about that and they said, well, we looked into it um, and you said, well, I think there needs to be more training. I can imagine that a response you would get is, 
we already do training. Um, we do training every year. Um, and they may or may not do, I mean, I'm sure if they said they do training every year, they do. Um, but is that if, if harassment's occurring after training's being done every year, then that means it's not enough to stop and prevent harassment because it's still occurring. So it's, it may need to be, they may need to up their game. Um, they may need to have a different training, call in trainers that'll train them to uh, deal with this kind of uh, matter, um, have more improved policies, uh, better notice to students and parents about what to do. Like Francine said, they wrote letters um, and they, um, and you know they made calls and they wrote letters. But if you, um, every school should have an internal grievance policy, and that should be very well known and made public to made publicized or notice provided of that, um, so that people will know how to do that. So those are the things that um, those are the ways, and that's what harassment is, and it's a, it's a type of discrimination. And you oftentimes have you've probably always heard about it more in the context of sexual harassment that, um, and even students are to be protected from sexual harassment. It's not just a workplace protection, but the law protects people on the, if the harassment is based on other, um, other protected groups. So if you target someone and speak derogatorily of them or do things like that, that is also, uh, that is also unlawful and people are protected against that under the ADA um, and 504, according to the um, US Office for uh, Department of Education, Office for Civil Rights. Now we gave some examples, but we're gonna um, move to the next slide and the next slide. And we're gonna talk about some um, other examples of, um, other examples of uh, disability discrimination and extracurricular activities. And things that there uh, that if it occurs or something like that occurs, it needs to uh, be addressed. So one is a school refuses to provide an ASL interpreter for a high school student who is deaf and uses ASL for a school play he wishes to attend with his friends. So this is that would be um, uh, schools are required to provide auxiliary aids and services. They are required to do it during. Um, activities, but a school might say, well, that's a, you know, you're not required to attend that. So, um, you know, we're not going to provide that, but it's a school related function. Um, and it's a high school play. He's going with his friends. That's a typical activity that people like to do. Um, and he's not going to get the same, he's not going to be have a full opportunity to enjoy that play unless he has an ASL interpreter. Um, so, and next to slide, we have another example. A school refuses to allow a student with a peanut allergy to go on a field trip unless her parent agrees to provide the student lunch and attend the field trip and act as a one-on-one -on -one aid to ensure that she does not eat anything unsafe. Well, that is an extracurricular activity, the field trip. Um, it might also be part of a class. It could be part of a class, but it might be an extracurricular in like an eighth grade trip. Um, but uh, that would be required to be putting restrictions on that uh, student's participation that's not on other students. Uh, so other students can go regardless of whether their parents can come and be a chaperone. And other students are going to get a lunch uh, that the school provides so, uh, as part of the program. So maybe the school packed lunches for everyone. So. That is something that uh, a peanut allergy, uh, especially one that can result in serious uh, like breathing problems, et cetera, that can be a disability under the ADA and 504. Um, field trips are extracurricular activities. And these are placing conditions or treating uh, people, a student with a disability less favorably um, with more conditions than other students. Next. You already, you already knew, Natalie. So student athletes, example, student athletes mock a fellow athlete living with autism by calling him offensive names and mimicking his, some of his self-stemming behaviors. Um, that would, uh, you know, sports events might, uh, you know, like a, a large track and field event might cause some uh, one with autism 
to be a little overstimulated. They might do some self-stimming to, to calm down and center themselves before their event. And then uh, to have being mocked and, and that, that, would, that could be a form of harassment. Um, and especially we, with harassment, it has to be severe or pervasive, which means there has to be a lot of it happening. But, uh, you know, a number of times that it's occurred, but this is the type of incident that could be part of a, a pattern of harassment. Uh, next slide. So a debate coach re repeatedly belittles and criticizes a student with a disability for using accommodations in debate practices and competitions. People with disabilities have the right to uh, of reasonable accommodation. Um, this, in this scenario, the accommodation's already been approved by the school, but the coach has a problem with it and doesn't want to implement it. Um, and, uh, it's, and so instead of doing that, tries to get the student to not want it by belittling them, making fun of them, making it difficult to utilize their reasonable accommodation. And that would be a, another, that would be an example of uh, that would be an example of discrimination. Next slide. So a school holds a separate dance for students with intellectual uh, or developmental disabilities rather than allowing them to attend the prom. That would be a form of discrimination. Um, it's segregation. Um, and we've uh, listed on one of the types of examples of discrimination is um, separate programs. Now, can, can you have some separate programs in schools if you want to? Could you have a, um, could you let a, a disability group have a special club if they wanted to? Yeah, there's nothing wrong for doing that if people want to, but when you make it the choice, that that's the only choice, you go to a different prom, that's, um, that's different. Um, next slide. A school has a, a free after school peer uh, uh, pro tutoring program, and they say, okay, that's for, that's for other students, but it's not for students using IE, who have an IEP. They can, get, they can get tutoring from their special education teacher. So we're not, we're not providing it to them. That would be a, a form of discrimination. That's not an essential, that's not an essential requirement for tutoring. Um, and so that alone would not be a, a reason to deny a student to participate. Um, a, a student with Tourette syndrome who has a tick in which he says offensive words is at times under stress, uh, is not allowed to make a speech when he runs for student government like other student candidates. Um, that possibly could be discrimination. Um, and because of his disability, he's being denied. Um, and there's no, they're not looking at, is there an accommodation or is there anything they can do to um, minimize um, or address that? Um, and they're just saying he can't participate in that. And certainly doesn't give him an equal opportunity to uh, win votes or be able to give his platform for his fellow students and what he's going to get for them if he became a uh, student president. Next slide. So um, a, a um, next slide. Okay, great. Um, a, a school holds auditions for orchestra in an inaccessible location and a student in a wheelchair is unable to attend the audition. Um, that falls into one of the categories we talked about. It is a, um, it is a, it's a physical barrier. Um, and schools can provide access by, um, in extracurricular activities, by moving, they could, if they can't um, build a ramp or do something in time for the audition, they can move the auditions to a accessible location. So they can create um, access uh, programmatically. Doesn't mean they have to remove every single barrier, but every program should be accessible to people, to students with disabilities. Um, and uh, next one, a student with a severe reading disability asks that he be provided with an audio of the script to prepare for a school audition, um, rather than being required to read for the audition. And the drama coach says, no, that's gonna give, that's gonna give him an unfair advantage, we will not do it. Well, that's basically a reasonable accommodation uh, or an more likely an auxiliary, it's kind of both, 
it's a reasonable accommodation. We're going to do things a little differently for this student so he can have an equal opportunity. And he also needs a he needs uh, materials in an alternative format. Um, so uh, that's another way to do it. Now, um, one thing that we wanted to do uh, kind of to uh, end this uh, presentation, uh, except for questions and answers, was uh, do a little, uh, provide you with a little clip to a, um, a video about a student who is uh, pursued extracurricular in college. She, well, not just an extracurricular, she got a, a scholarship, but it's a little interview between her and some of her student athletes that she is with. And this is what it should be like when there's no discrimination or harassment in a extracurricular activities. This is what it should look like. So Natalie, can you start that uh, video? Okay, let's see if this one works. If not, I've got the backup. Okay, Natalie's always prepared. Can you hear it? Can you, uh... No, and I think it's, okay. I'm gonna pull up the backup. Okay. Get out mine real quick. Okay, let's pull up the other one. Give me just a second, I wanna make sure that. The biggest light. Okay, sorry about that. And let's see if we can make it bigger. Okay, can you see that? Yes, we can. Okay, great, I'm gonna play it now. She is just the biggest light. Oh. <laughs> Two years after her famous putt. Yes, oh, yeah. The legend of Amy Bockersteady. I like you. I like you. <laughs> Only getting bigger. What's it like being a celebrity? Oh, I loved it. I love being a celebrity. I Amy. Uh, Awesome, Amy. Nancy, Amy, incredible. History making. Very nice. Thank you. Amy, already the first person with Down syndrome to earn a college athletic scholarship, Monday in Florida will become the first person with Down syndrome to compete for a college national title, playing for Paradise Valley Community College at the NJCAA Championships. That girl could do anything. She gives me goosebumps. We're really proud of her. <laughs> Really inspired by her. Aw, yeah. Hugging. While Amy's scores will count in the four-day tournament, and she pumps it right down the middle over and over, the 22-year-old even more consistent at pumping up her Puma teammates. Right next to each other. Best friends. Once you have a great shot, great shot, you have a bad shot, great shot. <laughs> like, every time any of us have a bad tournament, she's always sitting on the 18th hole ready to give us all a hug. Like... I love Amy. Cool. Do you, do you okay, Amy? No, not yet, girl. <laughs> it's not about the score for Amy. It's about the relationship with the person she's playing. You gonna help her set up? Help it. I like that. After creating the I Got This Foundation in 2019, this spring, Amy and company taking it to another level. Hey, with the inaugural I Got This Golf Academy. Eight weeks of instruction for people with Down syndrome and other intellectual disabilities. There we go. I like to help people to teach how to play golf and we need new friends. She's met so many new friends through golf. It's just been amazing. Yeah. Two years after I Got This made her famous, Amy Bacher Steady has a new catchphrase. We got this. <laughs> In Phoenix, Nick King. We got this! <laughs> Where was on his family. Let's go help people customize and save with Liberty Mutual. Okay, who sat at my desk? <laughs> thanks, Natalie, and thanks for having the backup. So we we ended with that because uh, in terms of the presentation, just because when you have a school that's safe and free from discrimination and harassment, then you know it's what it, it makes extracurricular activities better for everyone. Um, it allows people to participate and it allows them to contribute and to be a part of things. And that's why extracurriculars are so important and why we want to um, 
and like for this young woman, uh, helped her get a scholarship. Extracurriculars uh, are really important to students. So for many reasons. So uh, we wanted to uh, take this time to see if people had any uh, questions about, um, about extracurricular activities, non-discrimination, um, or any of the examples that we gave tonight. Well, there is one question in the chat from uh, Steve Friedman over at EPPC. His question is to Francine. Um, he says, great job, Francine. Are you participating in any extracurricular activities in college? No. I think she's busy. You're busy with school right now, aren't you? <laughs> Cool. And Francine has finished her, did her first uh, first semester and went really well. And she's now on her uh, second semester and she's working, as she said, working on getting that business certificate, maybe, maybe later. Francine has shared with me before that she would like to uh, teach other students um, tumbling and cheer. So that's something she'd like to do in the future. All right, well, thank you, uh, Rose. Is there any other questions for Rose or Francine? Mm -hmm. We're a small group, so feel free to turn your camera on and or, or your mic and ask a question. Okay. I'm not really seeing any questions. Questions, um, Rose. I don't know if you want to. You have any final? I have, I have, a, I have a quick question. Oh, that's from um, Hello. Um, if a student is harassing another student, um, is it considered? Does it fall under protections if they don't necessarily know there's a disability? It, it has, well, first of all, there are some protections for bullying um, that, that aren't, you know, there's a, some state law, there's a state law protection uh, regarding bullying. So if there's bullying and it's not necessarily related to disability, um, that still could, there still could be some protections. But when, when people target a person because of their protected group, then, then it's that, uh, then it's, uh, it can become unlawful harassment. So it can be protected because sometimes you don't, um, sometimes people do it because someone's different. Um, and, and the difference is the disability or, and you know, it might be that they're some, you know, a different religion or a different something else, but it, uh, but if it's, if it's done because of that, um, even though they might not say it to themselves, I'm doing this because they have a disability, but they're doing it because it still could be considered unlawful harassment. Yeah, I, I, that's what's happening with my son, but the coaches know there's a disability and they've not done anything. So that's where I've had to, to escalate because, um, you know, you know, there's a disability there. So, um, but I, I can't tell you, yes, my, the kid knows or doesn't know. The other kids know, so it's reasonable he would know. Yeah, and also um, if there's, I think another thing can be, um, you look at how do they treat other people. Um, right. And sometimes, sometimes we can tell when harassment is related to a protected status because of the words people use um, or the mimicking that they do uh, where they mimic a, um, like a, a yeah. speech thing or something like that. So we can look at that, uh, but it doesn't always look like that. Sometimes it's just, you're the only person with a disability and you're the one that's the target and you're always yes. being excluded. So that can, they can still be determined, you know, that still can qualify as unlawful harassment. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, do we have any other questions? I'm not seeing any in the chat either. I don't know, Rose, if you wanted to, to wrap Are, up. 
make a final uh, a final um, request to come tomorrow because there are a lot of important tips. We'll be joined by Amanda Glass, uh, a uh, our uh, managing attorney on education issues, um, and she's been doing uh, special education law and 504 work for a while now, and she'll um, help uh, help me present tips and ideas for make, writing good complaints writing good notices. And so we hope that you'll join us tomorrow. And if you can't, this will be, this recording will be posted, correct, Natalie? Correct. Okay. Um, and if you didn't get that um, Spanish, um, if you didn't get, if you want that PowerPoint, remember you can also request that and we will get it so you have it in English and Spanish. All right, well, we appreciate everyone joining us and we really appreciate Francine and your contributions tonight. Um, you made this program and we really, we really loved hearing from you um, and how you uh, persevered. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Francine. And thank you, Rose. And I'd also like to thank um, Alma Dossinger, our Spanish interpreter, Carla Martin, who did our closed captioning this evening, Terry Hayes and Lee Bradley for the ASL interpretation. Um, Amanda put in the chat the registration links if you, uh, for tomorrow. If you have not had a chance, please do so. Tell all your friends. And um, I know a few have already emailed me um, for a copy of the PowerPoint, so thank you. And um, we hope to see you tomorrow, same time at 5.30. Great, all right. Good night, everyone. Have a good evening. Good night.